so I'm going to start with just asking, you know, it's been nearly 15 years. Uh, how are you feeling now? Right. Um, you, you, you planted this flag, you got um, a lot of people behind this idea. Uh, you took some arrows in the back for, for pushing the idea. How are you doing now? Well, I, you know, I, I'm more optimistic than I've been in the past. You know, I think what has been done uh, that, I, I mean, what the first report did that Coyote and I, I collaborated on was to move the idea out of an extremely narrow group of people, uh, basically just the National Space Society and the Space Frontier Foundation into the broader popular consciousness. And, uh, and you know, we've started to see, you know, press stories on it. Uh, we started to see this become sort of part of the popular consciousness. You know, we, we utterly failed with two administrations uh, to, you know, get any real action uh, taken forward. But for the first time, we have congressionally directed, you know, work, uh, you know, that it, in its first year, you know, was it was still a you know pittance compared to the potential payback, you know, but it was it was finally in the tens of millions, um, and uh, and you know that work though it though at a reduced rate, uh, you know, continues today, and you know the other thing that has happened since is there's been a, an international renaissance that hopefully John will talk about, and a renaissance really around sort of you know, the, the traditional allies and members of the, you know, of the Quad and the Pacific. Uh, so, you know, the fact that we now have an institutional home, you know, this was the big problem. You know, we, we couldn't get the DOD to be interested in it on its own because they viewed it as a distraction from core war fighting uh, and not the security they wanted to do. And we couldn't get NASA to be interested because they thought that's why we had a Department of Energy. And we couldn't get the Department of Energy interested because they thought, well, that's why we had NASA. And of course, we didn't have anything like a space corporation that could look at it like infrastructure. Um, but at least right now, you know, Congress, uh, you know, sort of honored the Space Force by giving it, you know, uh, give, putting the money in the space rapid capabilities office budget and then the space rapid capability office you know honored air force research lab by deciding that they were the key performer to uh, move forward with spider and so at least we have small as, as it is a national program that's getting people used to and familiar with the idea with the credibility of the department of defense um, and at the same time as i said you know people are waking up to the fact that China's taking this very seriously. You know, the, their book that they published on space solar power is very clear that it's been all the way up. That has the formal approval of President Xi. So it is, uh, you know, so that has become, you know, clear to the US-China Economic and Security Commission and it's become clear to Congress uh, in their tasking to the National Space Council. So I suspect, you know, particularly, well, Fundamentally, I don't know how a uh, administration who's, you know, top, one of their top couple of priorities is tackling climate change can fail to mobilize and make use of the aerospace industry on space solar power. It, it would, it would not look good. Uh, and it, and it would be, you know, here we have an immense industrial base that can be mobilized in favor of green energy, you know, in across the board. And it's not just, you know, Air Force Research Lab and the Space Force with their research. There are many players from Department of Commerce, you know, to what NASA is doing on the Artemis Space Station. Uh, we need an interagency coordinated national policy on space solar power, not like our fusion energy program that's just a technology program you know, but with the goal of enabling the private sector to pr provide baseload power at scale for a global market. 
Okay, terrific. Um, there's some questions in the uh, in the chat relating to Musk. I'm going to kind of break that into kind of two parts. Um, you know, I've been referring to the Starship Singularity as the idea that we don't really know what happens when that new technology comes online. Um, so can you talk about, both of you, can you talk about, you know, if there was a patron billionaire, if there was a massive uh, capability of, 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 of uplift, uh, you know, what does that, what does that future look like? And I wanna break it into, you know, what does that look like in five years? Um, Alex, I hope that that answered parts of your question there. If I might, I'll step in here with regard to Musk. I have a slightly different perspective than many other people do. I don't think Musk has given his last word on the topic of space-based solar power. Steve Jobs said three days before he introduced the iPhone 3 at Comdex that Apple would never get into the mobile phone business because it was too far outside their core competency. I suspect that a company uh, such as SpaceX, which has an awful lot of very young people who are highly motivated to do great things in space, that this is something that that company is looking at. Um, I imagine that uh, um, they will pursue it when they hit certain criteria. I don't know what those criteria are, but I think that's what is going on there. Uh, I am interested in why Bezos and Musk both haven't attacked this more aggressively. Uh, they certainly have the analytical power and, and the wherewithal to get that done. It, it, you, while you may be concerned that they have all the resources in the world and would only pursue it if, it if it was meaningful or valuable, we don't know what other outside influences they have going on inside their companies. Something that we are concerned about uh, on the defense security standpoint, we receive an awful lot of foreign messaging aimed at our American public. We are a democracy. And in order to prevent space-based solar power from becoming a real thing, an adversary simply needs to sow the seeds of discontent with the idea, fear-mongering with it, to prevent it from developing the necessary consensus between two political parties to get done. One of the problems that we have is the pathway to 2050, which is the timeline that we identified in our space-based solar power study group report, is that it is going to be filled with Democratic and Republican administrations which for whatever reason, politically speaking in their interest, they tend to polarize issues. What one administration favors, the next administration will trash. And uh, this seems to be kind of the ebb and flow of where we're going. Do you think, so I have a very strong opinion on this, uh, that democratization of space means uh, spreading risk that if you have, and I mean financial risk, you know, that if you have a few patron billionaires, which is kind of how the market's evolving now, that I believe that that tends to um, uh, focus effort, but it, I also think it kind of tends to um, uh, have a herd mentality that, that, that folks tend to uh, uh, not take big risks it, because they're writing checks out of their own checking account. Um, I don't think the patronage model for space-based solar power is an appropriate model. I'm curious if y'all have any um, any thoughts on that. Uh, I know you're coming from perspective that that's not your typical answer. So just curious where you're at with that. Well, I don't know that it can't be a uh, uh a patronage model. I mean, in truth, you know, I could certainly see how, you know, Elon Musk, you know, could, could surprise us all. I mean, it would not be, you know, a big step, you know, to, you know, do a, a lightning fast, you know, megawatt class uh, demonstrator. I mean, he could essentially, you know, take something very much like his Starlink satellites um, you know, have some kind of simple, you know, robot, you know, stitch them together and show that he could beam a significant amount of, of power, you know, to the ground. And that would open many eyes and many eyes to investment. 
uh, you know, you could imagine, uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect that, uh, that Jeff Bezos, you know, would take exactly that similar route. I would suspect he would probably figure out a design that he thought was uh, capable and, you know, an initial customer base that he thought, you know, was reliable, and, uh, you know, and get a contract, you know, from them and then start launching those on his own, uh, on his own system. The, you know, if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have definitely said no, I, I could not imagine. But, but what's happened with Starlink uh, has really sort of changed my opinion about what even a single billionaire could do for space solar power, uh, you know, if they wanted to. Um, and I think, you know, once in the same way that people sort of doubted that there would be a market for Starlink, uh, you know, you could have a bold, you know, billionaire who, you know, would bet, you know, that despite what everybody thinks there, there would be, you know, a, a market and a market for, you know, something uh, initially, maybe it would look not unlike what Japan was thinking about with SBS 2000, where they were just going to be servicing equatorial nations uh, initially and would be a, a, a part uh, time. Um, you know, there's this, uh, I, I see Paul has asked, wouldn't space solar power be a competitor with Tesla? I actually I don't think so. Um, you know, first of all, Tesla itself, you know, is uh, is principally, you know, a, a car company. And of course they have, uh, you know, his power wall and solar cells, uh, you know, but those aren't, you know, 24 hours and they're not going to scale to city level. And, you know, there are many places where, you know, powering, you know, your gigafactory or powering, you know, your, uh, uh, you know, your, your ultra fast chargers uh, would benefit from having, you know, 24 hour uh, power. And, you know, to really affect, you know, climate change, for instance, you know, it's not just going to be one, you're going to have to be building, you know, uh, all of it simultaneously. And there's always going to be a desire to have power infrastructure close to you that you control that's a useful backup. Uh can you answer Alex's question about, um, you know, pho turning, taking photons, turning them into DC, and then turning them back into power? I, I think that's a pretty- That is a question best left for the evil Dr. Mankins. Uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that, right? So the answer is just point blank, because you get more at the point of need. So, you know, first of all, you're collecting, you have to consider what is the relative, in fact, let me just share a slide here because I think it's easiest to just go, um, you know, with a slide. You know, so this is, uh, this is, you know, Elon's argument for why this is the stupidest thing ever, right? So he says, you know, maybe, you know, you're getting, you know, uh, you know, maybe you've got a double the energy conversion you know, uh, you know, it's got to be better than panels on Earth. You know, you get more solar power, maybe twice as much sun, but then you have to do the conversion, right? So the first part is just wrong because, you know, compared to what you're having on Earth versus the equator, you're getting not twice as much, you're getting five times as much. And compared to someplace in a temperate climate, you're collecting 12 times as much energy, right? And then, you know, you also have to consider, you know, all the losses along the way, including what you would need for round trip energy storage. So you're doing way, way better, you know, even after conversion, it's like 18 times better. Um, and then, you know, I, I like to point out that the problems that we're facing are, are pretty significant in terms of what the world energy consumption is going to be. And if it's compounding, you know, around where it is now, uh, you know, for, as Jeff Bezos says, you know, we're somewhere between two and 3%, you know, you'd have to cover the entire surface of the earth for just 500 years, you know, all the while our, you know, energy sources are running out and the carbon's increasing. So, you know, it's got all these wonderful things of being, you know, renewable, scalable to global demand. And Elon himself has said that when something's important enough, you do it, even if the odds are not in your 
favor. And he, you know, talked about, you know, why are rockets expensive? You know, just because they've always been historically expensive, you know, but if you could wave a magic wand and rearrange the atoms and the cost of that was zero, you know, uh, they wouldn't be expensive. And so it's a question of figuring out, you know, cleverly, how do you get the atoms in, in the right shape? But the other, you know, part of this question about reconversion is that if the same piece of land, you know, can be at least five times as energy productive because you're, you have, see that the rectenna is like 85% efficient compared to the solar cell, which is going to be less than that. So on the ground, right, the, the, the area that you would have for a solar power cell can be reconverting those photons at much higher efficiency, less waste with a much higher duty cycle. So instead of a quarter of the time, it's 100% of the time. And instead of you know, a conversion efficiency of, you know, I don't know, 20, maybe 50% someday, it's 85% efficient. Um, I would put to each of you, uh, Peter, you said you had like you know four recommendations of kind of immediate actions. Uh, I would like to know what would be kind of from each of you task one, two, and three of the next. Let's let's really compress it. Of the next two years, we've got a new National Space Council uh, standing up. What would be tasks one, two, and three of the next two years? All right, I'll, I'll take that on. So, you know, task one is um, the administration needs to decide that uh, the United States will compete with China uh, on space solar power and will uh, link in its allies into a broader, uh, you know, effort on space solar power and it will coordinate a broad interagency push via a, a space policy or national security policy uh, directive. Uh, that's number one. Um, number two, we have to be thinking uh, long term enough. And so uh, it, it does not make sense to me. I'm a huge fan of going back to the moon, uh, but it has to be for a reason. And that reason has to be the broader uh, industrial base. And so I think that you have to, the administration needs to be clear that the lunar that the Artemis Lunar Base is a lunar industrial facility uh, that hosts public-private partnerships and that it needs to have manufacturing objectives. And I think it should be focused around space solar power. And then I think what you have to do is you have to, uh, uh, you have to make it easier for America to win at this game. And part of that is a portfolio of, uh, uh, of research, of you know, funding a portfolio of companies uh, not just one, uh, to develop different architectures and to make uh, and to create a market by saying we will buy that power when it uh, becomes available and that we will uh, that we'll reduce the cost of capital by having a Defense Production Act Title III, you know, finding as, as infrastructure with the appropriate, you know, whatever incentives that can make that can make this as economically viable as possible. Over. Any, anything to add, y'all? Yeah, so um, I'll add something here. You know, again, the, uh, <clears throat> the years of scar tissue working with Congress and uh, the politics where, you know, politics is local and it tends to be very selfish and it doesn't tend to have a long view. And it, but it has the power to crush any idea that's visionary until the crisis comes along. But uh, you know, I agree with Peter Gerritsen wholeheartedly that um, energy is the foundation of every economy. And uh, by starting with energy first, everything else solves itself. Uh, whether it's uh, power beaming to the transportation modalities and, and technologies that are buzzing around cislunar space, both within the gravity well and outside the gravity wells, uh, it doesn't really matter. If you own energy, you own the economy, you own the future, you own your values, you can protect them. It's getting the political class to understand. And, and, and the political class stopped learning a, a number of decades ago as the political rancor became more and more uh, vocal. 
Um, and it's happened in past as well, uh, but uh, it, this is our age of a uh, political class that is uh, incapable of understanding, or at least having the political courage to turn to a constituency and say, yes, this is gonna require your workforce to learn new things and to shift jobs in order to build new things, but we have to do it for our survival. And, and politicians do not move unless there uh, is um, pressure. In other words, unless they are threatened by their next election, they will not, they'll, they'll wait. They'll try to delay the decision. So um, I, I, I would say each of us in our own way, uh, using our networks to get after the political class and remind them of this, this stark reality that if, in, in 50 years from now, the American people will turn back and say, who the hell was in charge that let a strategic threat like this uh, kill our values in our constitution, the values of respecting people, individual freedom and liberty. <clears throat> How did this happen? Who are the leaders? And they will point back to this generation of politicians that squabbled over things and decided to go with the status quo and, and the money they spent was on uh, the horses and the candles when we had the automobile and electricity that we could have invested in. Uh, space energy and space transportation and space communication are the horse, the electricity, and the airplane of our day. And it would be like the people in charge of the American political system back at the turn of the last century decided not to invest in the automobile or in electricity or in the airplane because they were protecting the horse industry, the candle making industry. And, um, you know, and, and uh, it, it, it's that stark. It is that profoundly consequential to our prosperity. We, we need to get after the political class so that what Peter said will come true. And that is the, the law can be written that we are going to partner with these companies that are innovative and give them the non-diluted money to accelerate their journey and stop being so politically correct and worried about fairness that uh, if you give the money to Elon Musk, it'll make somebody upset and they'll sue you because it wasn't considered fair. Well, it's not fair when China steals your free speech. It's not fair when China uh, you know, uh, charges you more than you should have or blackmails you because of the pharmaceutical stranglehold they have on healthcare. Um, so I'll stop there, but that's the second point I would make is all of us have to be activists and, and in our own communities with our own congressional members, our own caucuses, reminding them, hey, you work for me. And, and there is something going on here that you had better get your education on and I can give you the people that can teach you. Find see some people you trust and learn what's going on and have the political guts uh, to actually vote for the kind of law that does a Manhattan type project. This is as big as watching you know, FDR, watching Germany building the bomb and not listening to, um, uh, to um, um, you know, not listening to his scientists, uh, you know, one of the biggest one was Einstein saying, you better do something or they're gonna be able to kill you all with one bomb. And the Manhattan Project, and thank God Oppenheimer was the man. Uh, there are women and men in this country that could do the same thing for space power, space transportation and space communication. And we would leapfrog ahead of China, I guarantee it because of our innovation and how creative we are as a society. But that's not even you know, in the cards right now, unless we put political pressure on Congress to actually write the law to say, we are gonna do this as a nation. This is a national vision. And, uh, and, and we can usher that in with Biden saying, this is the way to solve global warming. You, you, know, you can have a power grid that does not pollute mother earth. Uh, so there is alignment in politics and in survival, uh, only if we are willing to be activists and not be shy. With the uh, with the reconstituted um, and reinforced National Space Council, are there any? Uh, do we have any allies? Do we have any advocates at the National Space Council uh, that are pushing for this? I mean, I love the idea, but is there somebody on the inside? 
Well, I, you know, having lived through the last administration and being very close to uh, the very top level, um, I will tell you that it, even if you, one, we don't have any good advocates. There's a lot of very traditional thinkers on there, save for one or two. Uh, but they are um, essentially, if you don't have the vice president and the president and congressional members that are part of a uh, caucus supporting this, it will never happen. Uh, the power flow in the National Space Council uh, and uh, the executive branch and the legislative branch is such that if you don't have the vice president, the president and key congressional members on board pushing it, it will not happen. So we saw it unfold in the last space, uh, National Space Council, where they had great documentation, great strategy documents, great vision, but they were unwilling to push the bureaucracies below them, whether it was Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, Department of Commerce, uh, to be more aggressive at changing the way they were doing business um, because the problem is riddled down through. NASA is an example where you have a culture that wants to do one thing. Asking that culture to do another it takes great political effort, great leadership. And you, if you don't have the president and vice president and key congressional members on your side, forget about it. Um, so that's why you need this political pressure, this education. Um, and you need the advocates on the inside, but don't think there's gonna be a hero in one or two voices on the National Space Council that changes the trajectory of a culture that is refining the status quo and just trying to make better satellites. Sorry, I'm processing that. There's a lot there. Um, I, okay, so I'm a big believer, uh, I've risked my whole career on commercial developments in space. What role do they have? Um, what, what role do, does the commercial sector have? I mean, most of this conversation has been primarily government centric and government led. What's the role of the commercial sector in developing this new technology? So I'll let others that are uh, more in the economic realm talk about this, but uh, the short 10 second version is they are everything. But the, but the price of entry to make the business case close is so steep that if they don't have government help at a vision that can beat China, they will eventually succeed, but it will be too slow and China will be there first. So speed to the high ground before China is key. The businesses that will take us there, that should take us there, need help or all is lost. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I, I, you know, I got into this, uh, I was in my early 30s. Uh, I hadn't even committed to being in space yet. I was still in kind of that exploratory stage of, of, of kind of what I was gonna do next. And uh, I came across the idea of space-based solar power and all of these light bulbs went off in my head. Uh, I, I realized that, you know, without electricity, you can't have advanced medicine. Advanced medicine requires uh, pumps and it requires refrigeration and it requires all of these things. So without electricity, you don't have medicine. Without electricity, it's really, really hard to get uh, an advanced education. If you have those two things, if you have education and medicine, the very next logical step is, is democracy. So to me, the driver was how can we get energy to the world? And the thing I was focused on was if you can provide power to the top 300 cities of the world, you can provide power to 40% of the global population clean, green, limitless energy to 40% of the population, that, that is a task worth working towards, right? That is something that, uh, uh, that's, worth, that's worth putting your life, you know, you know focusing your life on. Um, and, it, uh, you know, to hear General Quas and Colonel Garrison and Colonel Smith talking about this uh, from their perspective uh, it's just, it's so incredibly inspiring. So, so thank you, gentlemen. I really appreciate it. We're going to turn it over to uh, Lee and then to, uh, to Tim Christman, but really appreciate it. Feel free to stick around. Thanks for taking the time this morning. Y'all appreciate it. This conversation is fascinating and motivational. I see why uh, uh, 
Steve had such success as a recruiter. Wanna, wanna march up to the front. <laughs>